Hi everybody, welcome to Friday's morning meditation, the last one of the week. Um, welcome. Um, great as ever to see you all looking on, saying hi, um, creating a really lovely sense of community here. Um, so welcome to this session. Um, we have some good news about Martin. He is um, apparently starting to feel much better. Um, and we're hoping that he may be back teaching with us possibly by the end of next week, but it is a pos possibly at the moment. We'll need to see how it goes. Um, but definitely things are, are on the right track. So that's good news. So um, at the start of next week, we'll have um, Kyra Jewell back with us again, which is really wonderful. And um, thanks Kyra Jewell for, for offering to come back again for at least a few more sessions. Uh, so just a brief rundown of what's going to happen this morning, same as ever, starting with a brief reflection, then going into a guided meditation, and then we will be finishing with questions and answers. If you'd like to ask a question, you can do that on screen if you'd like to. Um, if you just write a message in the sidebar where you're all saying hello, um, and then I can invite you on, you just accept the invite and hopefully if the tech's all working as it should, we can bring you on and it just gives you a bit more of a chance to ask a bit more of a, an in-depth question um, to Kyra Jaw and you can explore that together in a little bit more detail. But if you'd prefer to put your question in writing, we of course offer that option as well. There's an ask a question menu item right under the video screen, click on that, you'll get a pop-up box and you can put your question in there. Um, I'd also like to mention donations um, because we rely on them to keep bringing these uh, sessions to you every day. Um, we have ongoing running costs that we do need to meet that are generated by us doing this every day and we can only meet them through your generosity. We don't get money from anywhere else. Um, so if you're able to give anything at all, um, as always, it would be really gratefully received. Um, and you would be helping us to continue bringing this service to you every day. It's easy to donate, click on the donor button right underneath the video screen and uh, yeah, there'll be a couple of options there, Stripe, credit card or bank transfer. And half of what you give will go to supporting Kyra Jewel as well. So with all that said, I'm going to take myself off and I hope you enjoy the session and everyone have a great, has a great weekend after that. Thank you so much, Caroline, and good morning, warm greetings to all of you. Good afternoon, good evening. So I was thinking about what to share today and I was, didn't know until I talked to Caroline just now if it would be my last time with you. And so I thought, what would I share if it were my last time together with you? Um, I've, I've grown to really you in this space together. So um, I settled on of the many things that came to mind uh, on compassion. I think uh, this is a time so much compassion is needed and for ourselves and for others and well luckily it won't be my last time with you but i i will be happy when martin is well enough to come back so so i look forward to <laughs> more sessions next week but um the the practice of turning towards suffering with care, with, um, with love. Compassion is one of the facets of love in the understanding of the four Brahma Viharas, the four immeasurable minds of love that the Buddha uh, taught about. There's loving kindness, this friendliness, this supportive, affirming, 
friendliness. But another form of love is compassion, which is the willingness to be there in the midst of suffering, whether it's our own or another's suffering, to not turn away from that. To also, you know, one of the things that we can get confused with as far as compassion is pity. So we can, you know, feel pity for someone that's suffering or self-pity for ourselves. And that's actually not compassion because there's some idea of separation that's still there where we, you know, don't see ourselves in them. We see they're having such a tough time and, oh, poor them, let me help them. Um, but, but with compassion, there's more of a sense of um, that could be me. And, and if we really look deeply and we see our interbeing with all others, we know that that is me, actually. That person's suffering is me. And so our desire to relieve that suffering comes from, you know, a deep wisdom of uh, I'm in them and they're in me. And so doing whatever I can to alleviate their suffering is um, helpful to me and helpful to everyone. Doesn't mean that it's a selfish thing to be compassionate, but that it's just recognizing the reality of our um, fundamental interbeing, our interconnection. And so another um, element of compassion is that it's very, uh, it's very powerful. It has uh, a capacity of protection and I was some Sangha friends and folks that were based in Australia the other day. But we invited people from everywhere also. And one of the friends is a doctor in Australia. And she asked um, how to practice with the fear of getting the virus. She's a, a mother there and wants to protect her children that live at home with her and you know doesn't want to get sick but she's in this role and so um, I shared with her about how compassion can be the best protection in times of fear and I told a story of a monk uh, who was uh, during the war in Vietnam, um, they were taking care of people that had been wounded uh, from uh, an attack. These were civilians and they were, um, so, so Thich Nhat Hanh started the School of Youth for Social Service and there were thousands of young people who were trained and, and working to support those affected by the war. So they were t caring for injured people. They were protecting um, people in a in a school, I believe. Um, and and they learned that the two warring sides were gonna uh, were fighting closer and closer to them, and were um, planning to basically make that their <laughs> war zone. And so um, one of the young monks. Uh, decided to go and talk to both sides to ask them not to bring their fighting close to where there were hundreds of people already wounded, already, um, you know, homeless and in need of care. So he basically went into an active war zone with bullets flying to talk to both sides and ask them not to 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 come in that direction. And he was able to um, to speak to both um, commanders and they agreed they would um, have a ceasefire and and move somewhere else uh, and so when he came back um, 
you know, everyone was kind of amazed that he'd been able to do this. And, and he said, you know, the bullets avoided me. And, and they asked, well, weren't you afraid? He said, of course I was afraid. You know, yes, I was very afraid. But compassion was protecting me. Compassion motivated him, this desire to protect and relieve suffering. So, you know, this is just one story. And uh, for all of us, this is going to look different. But um, when we have compassion and deep love, that is an energy that we um, pervade. It doesn't just stay within us. It it moves and it and it can be shared. And so, um, when we live from that place, uh, it's it's an energy that surrounds us, um, supportive of us as well as others. Um, there's another story of when working to help those who were fleeing Vietnam uh, as refugees during the 70s, 80s. He and Sister Trung Kong, his um, long assistant and other friends, they um, had a boat, and they would go out onto the high seas to deliver math, math language um, books so that people could find their way to countries that would receive them so that they could start to learn the language and be able to communicate there and so that they had food. Well, there were many pirates on the high sea as well that would attack these um, boats of refugees. And so one of the friends the boat with Ty said, you know, we should carry a gun in case we meet these pirates. And Ty said, no, no, we'll ne never carry a gun because to the world our fear and our, um, you know, our intention to harm, even if it's in self-protection. And said, that's not what we're, what we're doing. We, um, we are going out into these dangerous waters protected by our compassion, not, not by our fear. So it's a lesson because, um, you know, it doesn't mean we take unnecessary risks, but it is a real, um, a real inquiry we can make. You know, when we go into our societies, when we leave our homes to go out and do what we need to do in these times of, of quite a bit of danger with this virus, what is it that can best protect us you know, in addition to social distancing or physical distancing and uh, you know, washing our hands and hygiene? But is there an energy that can also protect us and keep us more safe? And uh, um, I think love and compassion and the wish to protect ourselves, protect others, the, the deep uh, care for the suffering of others, for our own suffering, is a um, possibly a kind of shield. And it certainly um, keeps our minds um, protected from fear and panic and worry. Um, And it's something that other people pick up on. And, you know, just as fear is contagious, 
<laughs> much like this virus. Compassion, ease, um, confidence. What we practiced yesterday to be confident in the Buddha in us, those things are also contagious. So we always want to be in ourselves and not just in ourselves but in the minds of others as well so um, okay uh, apparently there's some difficulty with the sound sorry I didn't see these notes um, I will try to refresh and see if that helps or is it coming through better now it keeps breaking up um, okay I will refresh Hi there, checking to see if this is better for you. Okay, seems like it's okay for some. Great, okay, thank you for um, letting me know. So, um, just I'll just summarize the main points that I was making for those that didn't hear, and then we'll do the practice. It's just a, a reflection on the power of compassion to protect us in times of danger and the ways that. Um, Compassion as a form of love can be contagious, just like the virus is contagious, just like fear is contagious. When we have a heart full of compassion, full of care, full of the willingness to be there for the suffering of others and ourselves, that has a, a real impact on our surroundings, on our world. So um, I will invite us now to do a practice on cultivating compassion. And we'll trust that you'll let me know if anything is going wrong technically so that we can address that. So bringing ourselves into a place of stillness in whatever position supports this.
connecting with the mass of the body, just feeling this physical reality that has weight, that has volume, that has you know, this amount of space that it takes up, that has these boundaries and edges. Letting the weight of your body release onto the support of what you're sitting on. And really feeling the support of the earth holding you. That it's possible to release and let go. And to connect with the compassion of the earth. That is so ready to care and provide for each of us. Bringing attention to the breath if that's useful for you. And just inviting a settling of the body. Which is the container for the experience of the breath. The flow of the inhale, the flow of the exhale. And bringing to mind now someone in your life that you know is going through some difficulty. Someone who may be scared or alone or ill or overwhelmed with all they have to take care of. someone who's confused. Or angry. Or grieving. Let someone come to mind and if it's a few people, that's all right, you can Just allow them to be here together or you can invite one in and we'll make space for a few more a little later. Opening yourself to whatever their suffering might be. And 
feeling the motion of the heart to care for that person and their suffering, the wish for their suffering to be eased. And letting that wish come very naturally, very spontaneously from the heart and find expression in some phrase. I'll offer you some suggestions, but you can, Use your own words if that feels better. I care about your suffering. May your suffering be eased. May you be able to hold your suffering with compassion and tenderness. May you have all the support you need and allowing this genuine wish for the release of their suffering to grow in you and to extend to them. I care about your suffering. May your suffering be eased and relieved. May you be able to meet your suffering with compassion and tenderness. May you have all the support you need when you need it. If you find it difficult to call upon this energy from within yourself, you can borrow from a a mentor, a benefactor, a good friend that you have experienced to be very compassionate and loving and wise. Almost as if you're channeling compassion from them through you to this other person. And 
And as we get in touch with this energy of compassion, we're accessing the infinite source of compassion that is radiated by Avalokiteshvara, the Bodhisattva of great compassion that is offered to all by Mother Mary, by the goddess Gaia, the Divine Mother. So allowing yourself to embody this deeply wise very loving response to suffering in whatever form it takes in whomever it shows up I'm here for you in this time of need May your suffering cease. May all the beings of compassion surround you and support you in this time of need. And you could now feel this person or being looking back at you of compassion. Having received your compassion, this being now wants to offer you compassion for whatever suffering you're experiencing in your life right now. So allow yourself to receive the care, the kindness, the tenderness of this person toward you for whatever you've lost, whatever you have had to be cut off from, whatever frustrations or despair or sadness or restlessness that you have been going through, been enduring. Feel compassion radiated back to you from the great heart of compassion. And then you join in with this other person to offer compassion to yourself. I care about this suffering. May my suffering cease. May I learn to hold my suffering with compassion and tenderness. May I have all the support that I need when I need it.
holding yourself tenderly, the great infinite arms of care. Nothing is too small to go under the radar of this infinite, all-pervading compassion for you. Whatever it is, whatever large or small suffering, holding yourself with care, with gentleness, And again, we extend our compassion to another. So you could let another person come to mind, maybe someone not so well known to you, bringing to mind those that are alone in nursing homes or those that are dying alone. Or a parent that's trying to care for their children, homeschooling and working from home and caring for elderly parents all at once. Someone you know as an acquaintance or perhaps someone you read about or heard about who may be struggling right now. Letting someone or several people come to mind. Touching the difficulty that they're going through right now, whatever fear, whatever overwhelm, economic insecurity, physical pain, and directing your phrases of compassion to them. Directing the energy of compassion to them. I care about your suffering. May your suffering cease. May you be able to meet your suffering with tenderness and compassion. May you have all the support that you need when you need it. May you be protected and safe. Allowing the heart to open in compassion for the suffering 
of another. Now we continue to open our hearts and allow anyone in who may be experiencing some difficulty right now. We allow all the suffering beings to receive our energy of compassion. Those healthcare workers working over time and exhausted without enough protective equipment. All the children who can't go to school and who miss their friends. Those who are at the risk of violence in their own homes and even more so now. Those who are homeless, who are in prison, who are in detention centers, who don't have access to clean water and soap and masks, who don't have space to distance themselves physically from others. Opening our hearts with compassion and deep care for those who are struggling to get home from another country or in some kind of limbo because of this crisis. Those who are losing loved ones Those who are worried and afraid everywhere. Who are filing for unemployment. Who have lost their jobs. Who are struggling to pay their rent. Inviting all beings everywhere to be embraced in our care. Allowing the heart to open wider and wider. I care about your suffering, the suffering of all all beings who share this planet with me. May your suffering cease. May you be able to meet your suffering with compassion and tenderness. May you have all the support you need when you need it. And again, if you feel your heart is 
not yet big enough, call upon whatever forces you know to draw on to support you, to lend you, to reinforce your compassion with theirs. Holding the suffering of all. That all may find relief. That all may find solace. That all may be healed. That all may be comforted. That all may feel the warm embrace of kindness and care and compassion wrapped around them in this moment. Taking now a few deep breaths to close our practice. With each exhale, releasing and offering the sweetness of care and kindness on the wind. May all be well. May all be protected. May all be safe. Thank you for your practice. We have some time now for questions. You're welcome to come on screen too to ask a question. And let's explore together what this brought up for you. So there's two questions already. I'm just going to check that we're still connected here. Okay, good. Starting to see some movement. (laughs) Um, So there's a question from Ian. What's the name for this form of meditation? It's called compassion meditation. And there's many different varieties of compassion. Sometimes there's just sending compassion to yourself or cultivating compassion for yourself. Uh, And there's different kinds of compassion that we offer to others. Patricia asks, please say more on the near enemy of compassion, self-pity, how to recognize and transform it. Um, So, um, the difference between self-pity is, and and compassion for ourselves is, There's an energy with self-pity of um, seeing ourselves as a victim, of that uh, we reinforce our suffering by um, 
we, we lay on top of what we're already experiencing, this sense of um, almost a helplessness. I can't do anything about this and this is awful and um, and there's a, so there's a, a, in, a subtle implicit judgment that, um, that, uh, you know, uh, is, gets more identified with our suffering, that it is us and, and we are that suffering. And with um, self-compassion, there is, you know, I spoke about the four Brahma Viharas. This, so there's loving kindness, the first one, compassion, the second one, joy is the third one, and equanimity is the fourth one. And they all are interconnected. So when we're really deeply practicing compassion, we're also practicing equanimity. So with self-compassion, there's a measure of equanimity there that's able to see, first of all, this isn't just mine. I'm not the only one suffering from this. This is a, a human experience that I'm having and it's not permanent. It needs to be cared for and deeply, deeply tended to and it's not um, my life sentence. So there's some spaciousness in compassion that gives us the, um, the ability to still connect with some strength in us. Because what is it that's feeling compassion for ourselves? It's our wisdom, it's our insight, it's our, it's our um, wise, loving nature, right? So we, some part of us can't be fully embedded in the suffering to access that and to bring that compassion. That's why mindfulness practice is so crucial because it helps us keep that sense of um, noticing what's happening in us, not identifying with it completely. So, so there's a there's a capacity with self compassion to stay um, balanced somehow within the experience of suffering. Paul says, my body started rocking during this meditation. Why do you think that was? Thank you for that question. You know, it's a very deep body wisdom to rock. Probably from our earliest, you know, um, ape ancestors, <laughs> maybe even before that. There's a, a really powerful uh, natural instinct towards soothing ourselves, even babies, right? Babies know to embrace themselves and to rock or they make noises or they suck their thumbs to soothe themselves. The body knows how to take care, how to, how to ease suffering and the rocking, you know, there's probably deeper explanations than I know about the somatic what happens in the body internally with the rocking, but it's uh, an ancient, ancient thing. Whenever people encounter suffering, whether it's another that we rock when they cry, or a baby that we rock, or we rock ourselves. So humming is like that, swaying, rocking is like that. You know, sometimes there's with emotions like suffering and with the response of compassion, these emotions want to move. They want to be released. And so the rocking can help almost like unstuck, get them unstuck so they can um, move on and, and go on their way. So that's just one, one possible interpretation. But it's, it's really an interesting question. You might look, look at somatic experiencing and, uh, or do, do a little study on the, the deep meaning of rocking as a healing practice. I think it's a very good thing that your body got in touch with that. So really let, let that happen whenever it wants to happen. For That's for all of us. 
Martin asks, can you talk a bit about turning away from suffering during the times from the reality of what's happening and almost condoned this by the fact that too much news of suffering is not helpful. I'm wondering any advice on how to connect. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I think it's important to, um, you know, not get overwhelmed by what we're taking in. It is important to connect with the suffering, and it's important that we are very discerning about what what kind of information will will be most helpful to us in our practice, um, because. Uh, there's an agenda behind a lot of these media uh, that we're that we take in. It's the news, but it's also what sells, right? And so there's there's a lot of things that are going on that are very newsworthy, but they don't sell, so they're not being reported about. So you have to know that. Um, but I think in terms of turning toward suffering. Um, we could make it a practice to, to do a, a little bit of this each day, just a short, in a short, brief way, but to bring to mind um, one person that we know is in difficulty and send care to them. Could be something that we do very personally. We probably each know people who are, who are suffering in some way, maybe our own personal acquaintances or people we've heard about from others or read about. There's a, there's a, I think it's a Guardian article, uh, it's a page on the Guardian that's trying to tell every person's story, every healthcare practitioner's story who dies because of the virus. And I read through like the first 20 of their little biographies of the doctors, the janitors, the nurses, the, and it was, it was very touching to just see their pictures see their smiling faces, read about them. Um, so that could be something just, you know, to pick one place that's documenting people that are really, you know, being impacted and, and every day take in one person's story, turn towards that suffering with care, including our own. You know, and we want to be compassionate toward that part of ourself that feels overwhelmed with all the suffering around us too. That part needs compassion, not judgment. So maybe choosing small ways to take in, take in suffering. Um, Tanya says, my mind was very scattered. I couldn't keep hold of anyone in my mind. And connection with compassion was very fleeting. Just wondering how best to work with this. I usually find compassion practices easier to connect to. Yeah. Um, it's very normal that sometimes we can access compassion. Sometimes our minds are scattered and it's really difficult. Um, I think when you find that you are having trouble connecting to compassion, you can come back into your body. Just feel, feel your body, feel your heart beating. Come back and touch something that's happening in the here and now and regather, regroup yourself. And if your mind becomes more calm and you want to turn again to see if compassion can be ac accessed then you can try or you can simply accept oh today's not not the day for me to do this and then you can bring attention to body sensations to breath or you could even inquire inside yourself what what needs my attention right now 
if this is proving difficult, what might really, um, what might be what I need to do in this meditation instead? Um, and for sure, you know, turning compassion to our scattered mind, to whatever, whatever we're manifesting, um, opening our heart to that, you know, that's a kind of, that's a kind of ill being. So my mind is really distracted today. May I hold that with compassion and tenderness. May I allow that to be the way it is and, and not push that away. Mm. Um, and last, last question from Consuelo how to avoid the feeling that compassion meditation may be okay but I can't do anything for those who starve or are bad I'm, or I am not doing anything because I have not the strength to so I am in a little bit bit of a hypocrite. So yeah, there, that's a very natural feeling that you're wishing people well, but part of you is like, but they're not, not going to be well, I can't, I can't make their suffering go away. Um, and, and so this feeling of conflict that am I being hypocritical wishing them well when you know, if they're in a war zone, there's no way they're going to be well, right? But, you know, the, the practice of compassion, it's healing on whoever practices it. So it's, it's, a, it's an opportunity in this moment to connect with the suffering of another and to let our heart be touched by that and to increase our own, our own size of our own heart, our own capacity to care and let in and, and identify with those that are suffering. So it's not hypocritical, it's actually um, a very brave thing to do and not always so easy to um, really let in the experience of another and we're the first person that benefits from that and so um, our energy of compassion is strengthened and um, the way we look at the world changes when we see suffering the more we practice compassion when we see suffering the more we um, especially suffering of others around us the more we are open to act and to engage and to do something. So in our meditation, maybe we bring to mind someone who's suffering we can't do anything about. But then in our daily life, because we practice the meditation, when we hear and when we meet, when we encounter someone in our you know, day to day that is suffering, that compassion meditation brings up the words the thoughts, the actions that can really relieve suffering. So the practice benefits us immediately and it strengthens us so that we can benefit others who we, um, who we will encounter. And, you know, it's also, it's also not necessarily the case that our compassion Meditation doesn't affect the people that we're bringing to mind in our meditation. There are studies that show that when we pray for someone who's ill, that um, they get better, more so than people who aren't receiving prayers of others. So I would also just hold that a little bit more spaciously, that maybe what you're sending people, what you're what you're offering in your heart, maybe it does have an effect. We, we don't know for sure, but um, that's a possibility. <laughs> so really good to be with you all. Thank you for your practice. Thank you for your questions. 
I'm glad this isn't the last time, even though I'm very happy for Martin to come back when he's well. But I'm happy I'll see you all or those that can make it next week, at least the beginning of next week. So hope you can continue to practice compassion with yourselves and others over the weekend. And um, deep gratitude, I'll, I'll see you soon. Be well.